matter who you are, where you are, what your choices have been, and what karmic timelines and contracts you have journeyed, the light is calling for the reunification of all aspects of life in this realm now. It is calling for the cleansing of all polarities. It is calling for the rising of all sacred heart centers now. All are being summoned home to the greater light now. Hi, and welcome to Whole Soul Mastery. I'm Marie Moeller, and I'm an author, intuitive, and a host of these inspiring messages. And I'm here with Paul Panzika. We're back again today. Thank you, Paul, for joining me. It's nearly the end of October 2021. We're in the final quarter of 2021. There's so much energy, you know, no matter what, where anybody is in the spectrum of consciousness. I don't think anybody can deny that there's just, there's a veracity, there's a velocity, there's an amplification of energy right now. And there are many themes that come up for me when I think about the things you and I can talk about, but this theme of tests of faith, our faith being stretched, a lot of people feel like we are stretched, doesn't matter what exactly people are experiencing right now in their life. The level of change that we're all going through, regardless of your belief systems, your value systems, that level of change is testing us to our core of what we're believing in, what we go along with, what we comply with, all of these things. And I just want to also bring up that for the foundation, and I podcast for Whole Soul School and Foundation as well, we talk about the hero's journey. And there are very identifiable stages, at least that Joseph Campbell extracted from literature, that there's this universal hero's journey that we all go through. And there are these phases and stages. And um, the stage after crossing the threshold, when the hero commits to the journey, they're no longer just like dipping their toes in the water. They actually know they can't turn back to their old life, the ordinary world they were living. They're stepping into this new world. And after they commit to cross the threshold, and humanity's at that threshold, I believe now, they meet some tests. And then they figure out who their allies are and who their enemies are. And it's interesting and that theme of tests keeps coming up. I think we are being tested in our spiritual fortitude, in our courage, in our bravery, in our ability to listen. Who do we listen to? Where do we listen inside ourselves? Are people even listening at all, right? And you see our world, it just seems like a frenzy of energy. So I just, I think what comes up for me right now as so much is going on, there's a lot that needs to play out. We're in red October. We're, we're recording this on the 29th of October. I think there's still a whole lot of October left to be lived in just a few days time. And we are at this precipice of like inconceivable, unfathomable change that we are at this time in history in this ascension process where the world will change forever. And and we can all feel that. And yet we don't really know where it's leading us and how it's going to play out. And that's where faith comes in, right? So I thought maybe we could spotlight faith in these tests of faith and characters and in, uh, in the Bible or in, in, in our mythologies that might come to mind for you of somebody who was really tested and had to go through the stretching of their consciousness to meet the challenges to become that heroic soul, right? That you talk about so well. Right, so. <laughs> that was a lot. Um, yeah, no, 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 I, it's, it was good. So um, uh, we could think of all, a, a bunch of different characters and I don't, you know, I don't know if they are gonna actually fit into Joseph Campbell's model, but we can loosely base it on that. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, Campbell was a disciple of Carl Jung. So Jung wrote this landmark book, and it was called The Answer to Job. And it was a psychological analysis of the book of Job. And if you read Job, it's pretty depressing. I mean, 
it, it most of it is. In the end, so the, the, the story is, the story is, is that God and the devil have a basically like, um, uh, he, the, uh, uh, like a bet, you know, um, you know, what, like you a know, contest so, kind of a contest. Yeah. Let's, let's test this human being and, 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 let, and let's say that basically if, if he can be broken, you know, if we can break him. And so <clears throat> these terrible, terrible things occur to Job and they're trying to test his faith to see whether or not <clears throat> His, um, he, he finally breaks, you know, and curses God. And he goes through all kinds of terrible tragedies. And, you know, <clears throat> it's been a long time since I read the, that, that book. And quite frankly, I don't have anything in it that I would feel would be worth quoting, you know, <laughs> but um, Young's, Young's, Young's uh, analysis of it was very interesting, you know? So they, they push this guy and they push this guy and, and, and everything, he loses his family, he loses everything that he has. He loses virtually everything, he loses all his material possessions. Um, and he's basically like isolated. And then they attack his health and his health is attacked and he's just a, he's just a mess. Right. And in the end, he still has faith in a, <clears throat> in a higher power in God. Little does he know, that God's agreed to this test, right? So what is the lesson that we can learn out of this? Because in the, in the end, he, he's tried to the point where God, God finally steps in and says, you know what, this, this guy is really, he is, he is really worthy. And so we restore all of his health and we'll restore all of what he lost, you know, and everything in the end, you know, is, it, it, it ends nicely for Job, but only after he goes through these terrible trials and tribulations. Young's opinion was that, that that God was a maniac for, for putting him through it. You know, I mean, seriously, what he said was it was the point in human development where hum, where the human being became more moral than God. Is, is really his his where he where he where he said human the hum, human beings have demonstrated greater capacitance for for compassion than God himself. Now, it's really interesting because it, you know, I can't really comment on what God we're talking about here. You know, <laughs> I mentioned this before. That any God outside of us is not God. You know, that was Jehovah. That was Yahweh. You know, that was an external God, right? And so, you know, you always have God and devil, right? <laughs> and this sidekick is the devil. So, who the heck is that? Is that God? Or, you know, is it Jehovah and is it Lucifer? I don't know. You know, I don't know what that is. Or is Satan? I don't know. But the fact is, is that you know we were we were living in a time, especially when that was written, when an age where we lived under what they call the age of Aries, the mm -hmm. age of the father, and so we had these stern patriarchal gods you know, and we followed rules to the nth degree. It was very important for us. We had the Ten Commandments and we had all of these other things. And so, yeah, you know, I mean, that's what we were conditioned to do, you know, and quite frankly, um, you know, Saturn, Satan is Saturn, you know, it's a Saturnian energy. Mm -hmm. And that is all about control. It's all about structure. It's all about limitation. So this was something that if you want to look at it in a bigger picture and you don't want to, you don't want to point any fingers at anybody or, or, or basically say that this was, a, this was a transgression against us and all, well, you know, that's a limited perspective. It might seem that way from a larger perspective, you know, <clears throat> we're going through some kind of a process of purification. And, and through these ages that we're living, through this time that we're living, from, from the point of the fall of humanity, which probably predated that from, by a number of ages. Mm. So we had to learn these, these harsh lessons, you know, to have faith in, you know, and, 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 and in, in, in something that was promised to us, you know, that, that, that everything would be okay if we just had faith in God and in and, and, and the process whatever this process was, whatever it was, it was teaching us in the end, in that story, you know, everything is restored. 
and better than it was before. So <clears throat> it's not one of my favorite books. It's not one of my favorite lessons. <laughs> but well, I don't maybe we're going through this now. I don't know. But the point, I think, from a psychological perspective is, is that it came to the point where we had a greater capacity for love and for compassion than this externalized God. So what I always took out of it was this. Look at that externalized God as a parent. You know, do we have really great relationships with our parents? I mean, maybe we do. Maybe we don't. Maybe we never broken out of certain paradigms or parameters with our parents. And, you know, you could be, I'm, you know, I'm pushing 60. And, and, and it doesn't matter what accomplishments I've had in my life, you know, I'm still looked at by my parents as a, you know, 11 year old kid, you know, they, they just can't get over that fact, you know, so, and that's okay. I mean, I'm, I'm totally fine with that. All right. But, but the relationship between ourselves mm -hmm. and, and those who were in that role, playing that role, because, you know, you know, your parents do things to you. And unfortunately, people hold on to that for way too long. And that ruins it. That really has such severe psychological damage. And, and, they, and that's, it's used as a crutch. And, and, a, and, and, and it really inhibits people from, from letting go of all that karmic damage that's been done and allowing themselves to ascend beyond it. Okay. So now... How can, we, how can we really look at this in a mature fashion? Well, it was an age that we lived through. And at that time, we were much younger and we were less ascended. So for whatever reason, we had to learn this lesson. And it was a rotten lesson. You know, it was rough. We had to go through this. But who knows what we were before that? I mean, maybe we were all part of the Lantean downfall and the near annihilation of the world. You, you needed to learn some lessons, man. So now we get to that point and I think that was what Young was trying to say, is that you became, we, the man became more moral than the God, right? Mm -hmm. The paternal God, right? <clears throat> so now we, we had, a, we, we, held the, we held the high ground. We held the moral ground over God, who was, who was allowing this torture to happen to us. So, um, you know, you can kind of look at it as a pre- a, 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 a precursor to the next stage, which was in the age of the sun, which is the age of, of Jesus, of Christ, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, and that, and that, so, so what was happening at that time is maybe God was reconfiguring himself from a distant perspective and from a very external perspective in that age. Now God has to, um, has to incarnate into the world and has to experience these, have these, have, have these experiences. The logos has to have these experiences. Of what it really is like to suffer. What is, and because it, maybe that, that, whatever that entity was, it, I, and, and I, I can't really say whether that entity was the logos or whether it wasn't. Uh, but you know what? That actually is something we could probably talk about um, yes. before the end of this discussion is, you know, these gods are never always, they don't really come across as really nice. And it's something that we might be looking at at the end of the year or the beginning of next year as we move into this season of winter, in the winter solstice. This has to do with what you talked about regarding the harbingers of peace. I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Mm -hmm. All right, but we should talk about that towards maybe the end of this discussion or at least in a future discussion, we need to talk about this. But what happens is this, in a psychologically mature person, what do you do with your parents? You develop nothing but compassion for them because they're your parents. And regardless of whether they did right by you or they didn't do right by you, it depends on what, how you respond to that behavior. You know, We don't have all perfect parents, none of us do. And they don't always do the right things in our eyes, but they did what they thought was best, hopefully for most of us. And even if they didn't, you know, and they, and they, and they, and they did some really nasty things, you learn from that also. You learn from that also. In the end, whatever power they held over you, if you can develop compassion for them and, and for what they've done, 
um, then you take the you take the moral high ground, right? And and they they lose any control that they had over you. Not that and 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 and, and, and you know that happens through through this, these psychological traumas. Mm. So in a, in, a, in a fully mature or a person who's ascending to a higher level and be moving beyond the karmic you know, exchanges that we've been in prison for for a long time, you learn to have compassion <clears throat> even for God, even for God, right? So you, when you understand that, you know, and whatever that God was, whatever this Jehovah was, whatever that was, whatever Zeus or Jehovah or Jupiter, you know, that's where Jehovah comes from, is from Jupiter, is that you learn to have compassion even for God, right? So once you understand that and you stop blaming God for all of your problems, you move beyond it. You move beyond the karmic relationship or the karmic energy or the karmic fetters or the karmic baggage that you're carrying along and stop blaming God for what the hell happened to you or how the world is in such a mess. This was a process we all signed up for. And this is what we really have to do is liberate ourselves from that relationship in that perspective. Mm. That energy holds no strength over us anymore. But we must actually look at that and said, I grew from that experience. I grew from that experience. And you know, in, in, a, in a strange way, I have to think, think whatever providence or whatever that was for allowing me to get through it and learning from those tragedies and from those mistakes. Because you know what? You know, we're, we're, we're growing. You know, that's the whole thing. If you look at the world from, from a perspective of a developing human being, back then we probably were children or maybe young teenagers. And we needed to be taught some lessons. But I, I always think we're probably moving out of adolescence now and into now young adulthood. You know, you think you know everything and you're 21 years old, you don't know nothing. But, you know, you're legal now. You're, you're legal to do all these other things. And so now they have to give you, they have to give you all, all this, this is the point where we're at. The way I, actually, I actually did an, uh, um, a lecture on this. I said, okay, think of the human being or the human life um, timeline from the point where we incarnated as human beings to the point where we move along to a certain level where we get to a, a much higher level of ascension, right? So it's interesting that how our age correlates to our spiritual growth. And there's nobody on this earth that's living in midlife from a spiritual growth perspective. We're all either children or we're crazy teenagers or we're now starting to move into young adulthood. I always felt that Jesus, who began his ministry at 33 years of age, was, was his, his, his chronological age corresponded to his spiritual age. They said he was a fourth density being in the law of one moving into fifth density. So at that point, that's where we would move into fifth density in our early 30s. We got a lot more ascension to do if we lived, let's say, to 100 years. We got a lot more ascended levels to go through. So, um, you know, I think that when we get to that point now where, you know, these, these archetypes or these, 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 this, this paradigm that we were living within had any authority or control over us, that's, that's, that's gone. That's an empty energy. You, you, we're, we, are, we are bound to um, grow up and the time is now over with. You're either going to do it or you're not. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and now it's time that you're, you're getting kicked out of the nest and you better fly. And if you don't fly, you're in trouble, right? So, so this is where it is. I mean, it's more complex than just a bird getting kicked out of a nest. But that's really the point where there's no, there's no more gods that, that we can listen to that are higher authorities. In fact, that probably ended a while ago when usurpers came in and, and masqueraded as that higher authority. But now we're realizing, oh, that's a mistake. That's a lie. That darkness. That's, that's, and now we understand now that a person who's ascending who is, is becoming um, a moral 
person and ascending their consciousness is becoming greater than that archetype that controlled us. Whether or not it was uh, you know, benevolent or maleficent, we're, we're, we're moving beyond that point. I love that. I mean, I love perception shifting energies and insights because it is what grows us. Like at a soul level, what you just said is expansionary, right? And, and taking a look at God, the father as that parent and having compassion. It's interesting that you shared this today because I've, I've often thought about what it must be like and we don't know the answer, but what it must be like to be source, God, creator, whatever that energy is for each of us. But watching your children suffering, giving them free will, knowing that they're growing through these spiritual maturation phases of consciousness development. And there are these times, like I, as we reflect on Job, I've talked a lot about Noah in a number of the transmissions, the guides have talked about Noah, and then it comes through the marinades, messages, Moses. You know, we, we have these characters who I believe are real people doing extraordinary things with tests of faith in their own lifetimes. We are facing our own. And I think just the way Christ said, you will do all these things and more. I think there were times he was trying to give the message, you will go through the tests that I'm going through. You will go through these things and you will also access the gifts that I have to heal, to transcend, to transfigure, to transmute. And I know even that feels so foreign to people because when God is outside of you, you're always kind of answering to that parent or that perceived parent, right? Versus having an awakening from the inside out that you're the creator being inside yourself, discovering divinity itself and expressing that as yourself. And I think we are in this in our own times. There's no external answers per se. When you know, it's just like when, if, if you're a parent, and I know you're a parent, Paul, and so am I, when you have your firstborn child, and then you have other kids, there's no manual for parenting. I mean, we can buy a million books from the bookstores online or whatever, and you can go to workshops and you can interview countless other parents, but it's you that has to evolve to become the expression of the parent you want to be, and you learn and grow in that process. Well, it's the same thing. Like you learn how to be a better parent by being a parent. And I think we learn how to be better creators and better souls on the hero's journey or in the spiritual path by having these experiences through time. But we are at the point in time where no manuals of answers fit the bill of what we're going through because I don't think anybody on the living on the planet right now today has faced this kind of challenge at such an amplified level of what we're seeing with the divisiveness and the discord and the fear and the misinformation and all that stuff. And that is something that, you know, I'll say from my personal perspective, we are being also challenged to how are you listening? Who are you listening to? Right? Where's the source of the information that is guiding your awareness, right? Your consciousness. And a lot of people, in the spectrum of human experience in that sea of vibrational soup, I might say, right? All that energy that's pouring around our planet right now. A lot of people just are conditioned to like, you know, hear what they, they get the instruction booklet. They get the instruction from the media. They get the instruction from their neighbors, from their parents, right? And people are mirroring to each other, kind of co-parenting each other through this incredible time. But that's not the expanded bigger picture vision that gives you other ways to perceive things, which is what the soul is growing towards and craving. So I, th I, I just, I'm, I'm in awe by the people that I'm connected with that are willing to be humbled in this experience or be, be are willing to surrender in a way in this experience. I think people who would consider themselves awake, whatever that means for us, we know that there's like many more layers of perception that we're going through even right now. What I, the tools I used 10 years ago, I either need different tools, you know, in addition to those or the ones I was using aren't working anymore. 
So we're summoned to a higher perspective and not everybody's answering that call or they don't even hear the call. And then there are people that are hearing the call, but it's really unfamiliar territory and it's really uncomfortable. And when you're listening here and you're not following the rule book that's being given on the loudspeaker through the media systems, you know, whether it's in newsprint or podcasts or the mainstream media news or all the sources where we would go for information for generations, right? We've been conditioned that that's, you look outside yourself to get that information. I think in many ways, the Job's of our day, not that we wanna go through all the layers that Job went through, but when we are being Moses or Noah, when we are being tested, the, the information that we're looking for, the answers cannot come from outside of us. They have to come from inside and has to be that unique stretching in those tests that take us into the suffering that Job must have experienced at some level. I mean, we can imagine Noah and we can imagine Moses. They went through these experiences of struggling and having to let go and have the humility to listen to God's instructions the way they were coming through. They were growing too. Job seems very unique that, you know, his lessons were of suffering. It was like through the suffering, how, how deep is your faith? How deep can you trust? How deep can you go inside yourself to transcend and make it through the experiences you're having? And, and I think some of us listening right now might feel like we're living some version of the Job story of how, how, how much can I stretch and expand and keep the faith when things look so dark out there sometimes, right? And so I take it back, at least for this next part of our conversation is, I don't know that people listen or pay attention or self-aware enough to, to attune to how they listen. I know that was a refinement process in my own journey. I had to pay attention to the quality of my listening, I suppose, especially as a channel receiving messages, right? In the beginning, there were messages that were coming that I know was not just my human me, but there were times that the human ego was still there. And there was a refinement process until I just got so comfortable connecting with these higher dimensional realms that the ego me fell away. But there, there were definitely points. And I, I think that can happen to me even now if I wasn't continuing to cultivate awareness, right? The ego can come in anytime and masquerade as what I think it is, but it could be just the serpent coming into my consciousness and giving a message to, you know, stir the pot a little bit. I think this, this listening, that's part of faith is learning how to listen and how many people in our world are really, really listening instead of getting swept up in the serpent storm of the narratives it wants to give to us, which is the instructions it's giving to us. How many people have the ability to swirl around in all of that and say, wait, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna refine my ears. I'm gonna refine my faith. I'm gonna surrender in the suffering. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep listening until where I hear truth, where I hear God. How many people are doing that? I know. So <clears throat> what is it, that passage? It says, um, be still and know that I am God. Mm -hmm. And then you can contract that a little bit and you can say, be still and know um, that I am. Mm -hmm. And you can say, be still and know, or you can just say, be still, right? I mean, <clears throat> that's the essence of religious practice. That's all it is. And, and so that and when I have visions in, in my dreams, um, it, you can't, you can't, you, you have to be still. <laughs> I always used to say, I mean, I've written it a number of times, you have to be as quiet as a church mouse. You can't move. You have to just be still because something is, is being conveyed to you. So don't react. And if you let your ego jump in and react, then the message will be destroyed. The message will be distorted. So it took a long time, even as a young child, when I had like lucid dreams that were frightening to me to <clears throat> learn, first of all, that you could control a dreamscape, but you don't always have to control a dreamscape if you're not asked to control the dreamscape, if you don't feel compelled to. And then after that, you have to learn how to be still within, within the vision. And so that, that is extremely important to be still, <clears throat> to receive the information. And 
I always beat myself up because I thought a million different ways about this. You know, I always say, well, you don't meditate. You don't take an hour out of the day and you don't go and you put yourself in a trance and meditate or whatever it is and clear your mind of, but you know, I've received so much vision and information that I must be doing something right, right? And that to me is the essence of, of being able to learn how to be still, learn how to think clearly about a certain subject or to contemplate, or even more beautifully is to let go of the convention that programmed your mind in the first place. Go from it from a still point in your heart and create, be creative about it. Oh, well, what happens if this would be like this? Or if we do something like this? Or, you know, just go, just, just let it flow, right? And so it, 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 it's, per, it's pervasive. This problem is pervasive throughout our culture. We now have to take time out <clears throat> and learn how to clear our minds and spend somewhere between five minutes to an hour a day in order for us to, to be still <clears throat> so that we hope that we can ascend and all the channelers, and I'm not talking about you, Marie, but I listen to many, many, many sources coming from all these different channels and they all have different stories. You know, they all have different opinions and they all have different spins on what's really going on, you know, and if you're not, if you're not actively channeling an hour a day, I was listening to one a couple of days ago, you're not going to ascend, right? So, so, and I don't know what that means anymore. And I, and I realize that, you know, every single person is an individuated facet of God. So we come to it through different ways. I come through it through the ways that I've always done. I'm speaking to myself. You know, I, they would lock me up. They put me in a in a in an insane asylum if they had a, a hidden camera on me when I'm by myself because I have dialogues all the time. I don't know who the hell I'm, I, I do that all the time. I'm talking out loud. You know, yes. Who the heck am I talking to? All of a I realize that there's an element within me that's listening. There always has been. And so that's and, and and so that's it. That's a creative process. Talking to yourself is a form of meditation to a certain degree. Mm. But how pervasive have things become? You know, we don't have a still point. We've been conditioned to accept everything from a higher authority. Now, I'm a practitioner, and I don't even like to admit it that that I am, because right now I look at my brother and I go, Boy, "This what a what a millstone I have around my neck." I don't want anyone to know. That, that I actually have a doctorate because they've all gone insane and, 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 there, and there's all of this atonement that they're gonna have to, you know, all of these transgressions, it's horrible, right? So, I mean, fortunately for me, it means nothing. I, I, I knew I, I needed to have that. You know why? I knew this from the beginning. I said, well, I'm gonna have to go through this process so no one could claim any authority over me. I felt like I can't allow that to happen. So I need to become an expert in something so that there will be no higher authority over me. And you know what? That's what a doctorate is. You have a highest authority. If you get sued, you're the one who's getting, you do something wrong, you're the one who's getting sued because you're the doctorate, you're the expert. So that was really the reason why I did it. But if you really look at it, I, I have no value in it at all. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. But as a practitioner, what I found which is really frustrating and sad what do you think the most difficult thing is for parents for a parent to do the most difficult thing right now for a new for a, for a, for a new parent nurse their babies mm -hmm. no one can figure it out anymore you know it always a first baby it's always a disaster you know it, it was because, for me it was a total disaster and nobody can help an opinion on how to do it I know you, you need a you need a lactation consultant on your baby's tongue tied and all these other freaking problems you know what uh it's not a problem for for people that are born in the amazon you know they they know how to do it because they it's an innate intelligence mm -hmm. that they don't trust anymore mm -hmm. so so we all have the innate intelligence that we no longer put any faith in right and that's a big part of what faith is. Faith is your capacity to know without having anyone else tell you what it is. And so, okay, so well, why well, I put my faith and trust in God? Okay, I hope you're putting your faith and trust in, 
the God-given intelligence that you carry within you. And that's where the voice of God exists. And that's where the intelligence comes from. You know, you didn't live this life one time. You lived this life for thousands and thousands of times. You know, and I mean, how many more times do you have to live it before you can start connecting to that innate intelligence to how to take care of your children? You know, it's gone insane. Every single child now has some problem or another that the DSM is, you know, identifying and classifying. And, you know, and that's because of the environment that we're growing up in. It's, it has nothing to do with anything else. It has to do with the environment that's creating this. And we're, what we've done is we've, we've allowed the devil, and you want to call it the devil, you can call it whatever you want, but we've allowed this, <clears throat> these protocols into our life so that we have now me having an experience, but I can't just have the experience. I have to have an interface which is connected to this usurping energy. And it's usurped itself in every aspect of our life. And until we get rid of this interface, we will never become free and sovereign beings. And we will never be able to discover our, our, our God-given talents, our, our innate intelligence, which by the way is is directly related to your immune system. It's directly related to the health of your body. It's directly related to the health of your, of your family. It's directly related to the health of your extended family. It's directly related to the health of your community. It's related to all of those things. You know, they say that the most exquisite and, and accurate scientific instrument that has ever been developed is the human body. Oh. Why are we putting instruments between ourselves and our observations? It's gotten to the point of insane that I can have an experience, but it's not recognized as valid unless I have a device that measures it. Right. I measured it. I have the experience. I know what I experienced. But no, no, it's not really recognized in an externalized form of existence as sanctified so it's just some some strange you know enigma that will never never go on to be explained I mean, you can explain it you have the experience i have an experience and if you have the same experience then it's validated you don't need anything else to validate those experiences oh i love how you described faith and we are in this process there is a summoning to the sovereignty which is why it's so uncomfortable because we have to look at all the ways that we give our power away. You know, if we have those 60,000 thoughts a day that I keep, it's, that just keeps coming to me more and more. And I'm sure we have more than that. But if, if we somehow attend to an average of that, that's bombarding our energy fields again to also, and then those thoughts pass through our egos, the filters, right? That, that are informing us of how we think we feel or we're experiencing our lives. Yes, please. But we're allowing that to happen to us. We are allowing that because we, because people think it's just like, this is all there is. This is the way that it is. If you're not doing those things, then you're crazy. Maybe some of the reasons you talk to yourself and I think in some ways that's where the channeling began for me because I needed answers and no one from this world had them. So I began seeking to connect with the guides and my higher self is in there as well, you know, seeking to have that and understanding that there was a different perspective than the programs that were running me on the situation I was dealing with. It was traumatic. And so when you, and it was interesting time and time again, you, I'm not unlike most other humans. And when I was in my particular trauma in my life, you go to the doctor, you go to this other professional, you go to these people you think are the experts. And one by one by one of them, you know, I could see just, they knew they had no answers for what I was going through. I'm sure you see patients where you also don't have answers. Not everything has an answer from this world in the kind of medicine that can be practiced still today that has limits. Even, even your holistic practitioner, but even with that, there's still limits to what we understand of because we haven't expanded further to know more. 
And what I've learned is my life has gotten far better, far greater, far more rich. There's a richness to my life because I'm out of that box. When I finally said the box that doctor's in, they don't know what I need. They don't even have a clue how to help me and my family. And it was written all over their face. And some of them were courageous enough to tell me that. There, we, don't, we won't have an answer. Maybe in 10, 20, 30, 40 years, we'll have an answer. They told me that when I was in the middle of a, like a 24 hour intense struggle for an extended period of time and years. You tell that to somebody, well, we might know something in another 30 years and we'll get back to you. That doesn't help somebody in the moment of their pain and their suffering. And that's when suffering, I know they're not, I'm not talking about martyrdom because that's a whole other thing, but there are gifts in the suffering. If we'll learn to check in with all the filters and we witness ourselves having these filters, I had to watch myself and say, oh my gosh, these people don't have any answers. And it's not just that one physician or that one hospital or that one professional. It's th this world. It's like, you know, and I went far out there, you know, <laughs> I was a seeker. So nothing stopped me from picking up the phone and, or emailing somebody to like, you know, another insight would come and another connection would come into my life and I pursue it. I would look for the, those solutions, but I realized that nothing for the kind of tests I was going through was going to come from this world. I had to get beyond the perceptions I had and the filters I had to see beyond that. And I think that's where humanity is in our own ways, in our own spectrums of experience right now. That's what we need. And when we're still giving our power to some expert on the TV, I. I hope the people listening to our podcast aren't saying, oh, I can't wait to listen to Marie and Paul, the experts in the, you know, this spiritual development. No, we are experiencers. We've ridden the waves. We're still riding waves with ourselves. We're still growing. We're sharing experiences with people. We're sharing slices of consciousness that people can be enriched by or take in and, and look at themselves and, and check in with that. But I think there's something that's happening that, of course, amidst all of the sea of confusion going on, it's shattering the myth of this belief in experts, per se. And maybe if we even, I know some people would think this is sacrilegious to say, but maybe even looking at God creator as an expert, more as a living being who has mastery is, is that kind of omnipresence in its own way, omniscience. And, um, and we're, we're struggling to find that in ourselves, but the struggle relinquishes, it releases when we admit that we don't know what we don't know. And when we admit that God in the perfection of, of like leading edge creation, the creation is always creating itself. I know like God is omnipotent. We can go down a rabbit hole here. I don't wanna get trapped in that right now in this conversation, but I'm saying, I think there's discovery. I think that's what creation is for. That's what physical manifestation of life is for, is to, is to experience the living consciousness always expanding itself. And so it's interesting that you said that we had these ages characterized by certain things in our spiritual development. And I wanted to go back to that. Maybe that's a way to kind of bring some of this around again is to say, then what age are we in? Is that referring to the age of Aquarius? What age are we in, Paul? I always say that I'm about 18 years old <clears throat> from a spiritual perspective. Maybe I'm a little bit older, but I, I never felt <clears throat> that I ever grew up. I mean, I just couldn't get the knack of it. Let me give you an interesting, now I think it's an interesting story. You know, from a psychological perspective, I, I, there, was, there isn't much of, of a difference between when I was that age and where I'm in, I am now. I can never figure out how, how, how to adult, you know, how, I mean, I, I clearly have done things. I must have been able to do something, but there are other things that I, I, I just don't care about. I, I, I don't, and, and so I, 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 I'm, and so this was the story. My, um, <clears throat> my wife's girlfriend, one of her girlfriends, um, they were professional people. She was an, I think a local, no, she was a journalist or an anchor, I think. Mm -hmm. And her husband was a very successful doctor in his own right. <clears throat> so they had, they accumulated a lot of wealth and they 
I was probably about 45 years old. And, um, and, they, and their daughter was graduating college, which is a wonderful thing. And <clears throat> so they, they built a new house in our, in our community. And they had, a, they had this giant party. Everyone came over. Um, that all, all, then there was a, a group of women that my, 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 my wife was associated with. And so <clears throat> all these people came. And so there were a lot of people that I had known for a long time in this group. So <laughs> it was a beautiful evening. It was like a Saturday afternoon. It was early summer, uh, beautiful house, <clears throat> beautiful house. And uh, it was early, ap early, early evening. We're going in right after dinner. <clears throat> and at that point, I decided to have this midlife crisis. I just went into this major midlife crisis. I'm like, wow, what, what is this? And so what I found in the process of the, uh, during the evening was I was, try I was attempting to have conversations with people, but I wasn't very successful at having any conversations outside of a very mundane parameter. We were talking about nothing. We we're talking about business. We we're talking about our vocations and we were talking about Shitter chatter, blah 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 blah, and I'm going, well, what's going on here? I can't find anyone to have a conversation with, mm -hmm. and I and I, these are people that I've known for a long time and I respect and they're nice, but can't we talk about something else? Real? And I couldn't. I couldn't, and I was having a breakdown. And uh, at the end of the evening, I mean, I was talking to the teenagers. I was talking to the kids. At the end of the evening, I was downstairs in the basement playing with Legos with the little kids because because I kind of had like a more of a connection to them than anybody else. And I'm like, you know, so that whole experience really threw me for a loop. <clears throat> and I couldn't understand why I was associating with the children, why I, why I was so upset about this, because, you know, this is how life is. We don't have significant conversations with people in social gatherings. Just doesn't work that way. We just don't do that, you know. Um, um, and then I started thinking about what it felt like when I was a child. And then this memory came back. That so I had this this memory, and the the, the memory was waking up when I was about four or five years old on a Saturday morning um, when they would when they would start children's programming, which was all these frenetic little cartoons that we would watch. And that was the only time you could watch them when they had frenetic programming for children. So we'd wait all week to watch frenetic programming for children. And we would wake up, we were so eager to watch it. We'd wake up a half hour before the frenetic programming for children would start. And you'd watch a test screen at the beginning. Then you'd watch a farm report, which would go on for about 15 minutes. And then the programming would start. So you'd sit there in anticipation to start watching frenetic programming for children. And so um, it was a few more minutes before this, the, they were droning on about the farm report and the crops and all this other stuff. So I ran into the kitchen and, um, and, I, and, and I was a little guy because the, the base cabinets were, the doors were as tall as I was. So it was, it was pretty small. And I remember running into the kitchen, opening the door, grabbing a box of cereal with that was about half the size of who I was, sticking my hand in there, reaching around, seeing if there's anything on the bottom of the box. You always put little trinkets and stuff in there. And nope, it wasn't there. Somebody grabbed it already. Grabbing a handful of this puffed rice or whatever it was with a lot of sugar and sticking it in my mouth and chewing it and eating it. And then I remember looking at the kitchen window and the sun was rising and the, and the light was streaming into the kitchen. And it was a, it was, my dad had a green and a green and, and white kitchen. And it was, it was a, it was a two-tone tile, 12 by 12 tile. So everything was all painted green or white. And I just remember looking at the sun and streaming in and eating the sugar and going, yeah, I feel pretty good right now, you know? And then I said something weird to myself. I said, you will remember this moment for the rest of your life. I said that. Jeez, Paul. Wow. You remember this moment for the rest of your life. Why I said that out loud to myself, I don't know. 
So <clears throat> I so as I got, grew up, I used to recollect that as one of my first memories. And I used to always remember what it was like to be that age at that moment. Oh yeah, remember that weird time you said that? Oh, that's weird, you know? And, and then 20 years go by. Now I'm having the midlife crisis and that memory pops into my head. And I'm going, why am I thinking about it? Why am I thinking about this memory? And then it, then it occurred to me, I went, oh, that's why I'm thinking about it. Because there was no difference between who I was then and who I am now. Not in my sense of that level of consciousness. It never changed, you see. I was still that person. And that's who I was at the party. I wasn't living in that ego. I was living from the heart at that moment. And I went, there's no difference. It's, it never changed. So whatever else builds up upon that. You know, they say that everything we need to learn in life, we learned in kindergarten. Right. Right? That, that was a famous book that was written. And, and, and uh, I'm trying to remember the name of it, but that was the name of the book. So there isn't, and, I, and I've heard this from other prominent, um, prominent spiritual teachers. There's one man that I absolutely adore. His name is Dr. Stephen Heller. And he's a Gnostic minister. I think he's still alive. He's got to be in his 90s now. He's just an amazing, amazing teacher. And I heard him mention that once. He says, you know, you really don't change. Your, your true nature, your true consciousness doesn't change throughout your life. It's just your perceptions change. It's just that your ego changes. You know, it, 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 and that leads to distortions. So I'm not sure if I answered the question in the way that you were talking about age ages but you know i feel like i'm not talking about a spiritual age here i'm talking about um the the true age of who you are let's say that we incarnate we we at some point go from we we, we go from like whatever we were an animal before whatever it was or maybe we never were an animal but we go from we, we enter into the spiritual realm into physicality as a human being. And I'd venture to say that everyone living on the earth right now has done this more than once, right? So you have to look at that as you're living these experiences. And they say that when they look at from a higher world or a, an advanced society or world, they can, they can determine, you know, how evolved you are or, or how you've learned these lessons in life, right? So let's say, so let's say human humanity on this planet versus Pleiadians, you know, on era, the planet era, which is one of their allegedly other planets. They're far older and, and wiser than us, but it, they might not have even lived as many lives as us, uh, or maybe they have, but spiritually they're more mature, right? And so we're talking about a level of spirit, spiritual maturity that we carry within us. I mean, really, if you look at this and you look at all the craziness that's going on in the world right now, I would say that externally they're old, but I would say that spiritually they're, they're, they're still adolescents. They're still, they still haven't learned their lessons. So you're very, it's very rare to find somebody. I mean, you could, I've seen this happen many times. A young woman comes into my office who's a teenager who's already so far more spiritually mature than I've had most people have ever met, right? Where does that come from? So they carry that, those lessons that we learn in life. What do we carry within us? What are the lessons that we, we learn within our, within our life? Well, you know, music, mm. Mozart. That's why Mozart was Mozart. He was, a, he was playing, he was, he was composing music and playing with the soul of a grandmaster when he was a child. You can't teach a child to do this. He carried that within himself, right? So that, that was, they say that those, if, if those are, the, you know, you can see people just incarnate into the world, pick up an instrument and they're doing it, right? Without any formal training, right? So that's something that stays with us. That's not completely erased from one incarnation to another. I would say that, you know, we learn lessons in life. We learn through hardship. We learn through mistakes. 
So we always used to say, what's the difference between a saint and, and, a, and, a, and a sinner or a really immoral person? The, the only difference is that one learns their lessons, the other one doesn't learn their lessons through their transgressions and mistakes. Once so again, Rudolf Steiner said this, he said, those who are the most highly, more spiritually evolved in our society have greater and greater and greater debt because um, to karmic debt, because the only way they can have gotten to where they've gotten is to learn through what he called the deeds of deeds of love, right? So, so we, we, we accrue these experiences. They don't come off like, I'm not going to remember algebra in the next life. Maybe I will. I don't know. Maybe I will. But I probably won't remember that. But I'll remember what it felt like when I committed a severe transgression. Mm -hmm. And I don't want, ever want to go through that again. Or I'll remember what it felt like when I made a stupid mistake that, that caused me to die or somebody else to die. Or I might remember what it felt like when I murdered somebody. Or when I, well, when somebody murdered me or when I got raped or what, whatever that is. And an empath or an intuit, a, a person that's spiritually attuned, you know, it's a mistake to tell that person you can have, you know, if, so let's say somebody's trying to give you comfort because your child died. And a lot of times we just have to grieve on our own, but you can give people comfort. And the person who's grieving may say something really malicious and they'll say, how can you possibly know what it feels like? You know, you haven't lost a child. Well, not in this life, but I guarantee you I have. And I know exactly what it feels like. So as we, we as we live through these incarnation cycles and these lives that we're living, we we do carry within us the treasure of the gold that we learn through these lessons, right? And so we do accrue that, you know. But they they used to say that in Theosophy, they used to say that the superficial and mundane lives that most people are living live you live. 80, 90, 100 years of a, of, of, of a full life physically. But how much do you actually develop from a spiritual perspective? Six months, if you're lucky, right? Six months. So, so there's two different timelines or there's two ages, you know? There's two different ages. So, so you can you age from a higher perspective, from a spiritual plane, you know, we're still imbeciles. We're not imbeciles, but we're, we're still adolescents. Most of us still are. And there's a few of us that have made it into young adulthood. And these are the empaths. And these are the people that have really deep insight as to what's going on. And they are with, they have no other option. The world has no other option. They must be discovered. They must be, must, they must stand out from the rest that are still developing. Because you know what? There's gonna be nobody from outer space or nobody from the transcendental realm or nobody from the trans-dimensional realms that's gonna fulfill that role anymore. We were told this, Steiner actually said this. He said that you know a lot of, the, of what the mystery schools are all about and what these streams of consciousness, you know, these people are who, are who are learning these lessons <clears throat> through these sequential lives and souls that get involved in into this esoteric training, <clears throat> these mystery schools <clears throat> are being taught by ascended masters from who ascended their consciousness. He literally says this on other worlds. Wow. So yeah, Rural you know, Sanger knew about all of this. The anthroposophical uh, society doesn't it doesn't acknowledge it. Mm. which is so sad because there are so many people that are channeling these energies from other worlds that are totally credible and have these, these wonderful information to share, but you know, they shun those people. And they, but Steiner said that. And he said that what will eventually happen is that the pupils will have to become the teachers. And, and we are at the point now where nobody's coming in from other realms or other worlds physically to step into that role of mentors, we have to do it ourselves. And 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 the only and the and 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 I've heard this actually channeled recently. I got real excited when I heard this, is that that's this is in place now. This will happen. And if people wake up enough, they don't have to wake up to be an ascended master, but they have to wake up enough to 
attune themselves, those who are amongst them, there'll be enough amongst them to want to be like them or, or to emulate them. Emulate. Or, um, you know, the way that, the way that it's described is that, you know, when you, when you look at the principles of teaching human beings, the first phase of that teaching in the first seven years is related to what we call role modeling or imitation. You learn through imitation. You learn through role modeling, right? <clears throat> now we're past that point. Now we're into learning through what they call imagination. And then we, when we go into thinking, that's our, that's, that's our later adolescence. And then we go into adulthood. But you know what? Um, learning through imitation is the most visceral way that human beings can learn, not just children adults, everybody, we learn through imitation, which is why we're being programmed with all these terrible, terrible role models and visions. And, you know, they're, they're showing us how to behave badly and, and how yes. to think poorly and, 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 and to accept that as a, somehow or another, the norm of how human beings should be. They've, they've, they've degraded us to a point where, you know, we, we, we're, we're, we're just animals and, and that's just wrong. And that's not how it's gonna be. And we're talking about, we hopefully, by the end of this year, the beginning of next year, uh, events are unfolding that will allow people to stand up. Um, they're already standing up, I'll tell you that right now. But that will, the, the, the things will get so bad that those who are living in truth will be a greater and greater, greater contrast to the insanity and the darkness that's surrounding everybody. And they will, they will stand out like a beacon. And that's where we're going with this. Um, and you know, yeah. there isn't going to be. There's going to be no politicians that are going to save us. There's going to be no people from other worlds that are going to save us. We are going to do it ourselves. We we have to. Otherwise, you won't survive as a species. And they're working on trying to ex extinguish us. Mm -hmm. They're trying to destroy Homo sapiens. And in a way, it, that may happen. You know, we talked about Homo luminous yes. as one option, or a trans a trans, what is it, the, the trans um, humanistic Figure. pathway, right? So we need to make it, we need to start moving forward in, in this and we need to embrace the change. We need to embrace the ascension because they're already amongst us. They're already there. Mm. They're already speaking. They're already channeling the spirit. They're already there, you know? And that's, I think, where we're going. There's somebody that I love that I do enjoy listening to that gives a broader perspective on all that's been going on with the pandemic and the virus and all these things. And I heard her speak just in the last 24 hours in a podcast. And she said something that really spoke to my core. She said, because she was, she's been out there courageously sharing her message. It takes courage. It takes courage to be the empath, the inner knower, the knower who knows things, right? And also can admit that we don't know some things and holding both of those things. I know deeper than most people's ego minds know. And I'm also open to what I don't know. And I'm open to discovery, both those things. She carries that energy inside her. And I appreciate that about her. And she was speaking to a whole group of people about all of the details of this thing and a bigger picture perspective on a, on a lot of it. And this could trigger some people, but still just to say, she was saying, she said, I'm not here to wake the sheep. I'm not trying to wake up the sheep on the planet who are still sleeping. She said, I'm here to wake up the other lions. That's what you're talking to me. Also, what you said that today is that there are the empaths, the beings who have known and journeyed into these other realms, who've lived through some other ascension timelines. We are the ones recognizing what this looks like. We are the ones recognizing that this is either a humanity and a planet on the brink of extinction, or this is a planet on the brink of a great awakening. Right. And we can tell the difference. We can see the difference where a lot of people who might just not have journeyed as deep into those other realms right now, at least would sit, would feel I'm not accessing that. I can't see what they're talking about. And when they can't see, they listen to the instructor or the propaganda that they can see, which is more of what they already know. That's why they listen to it. There's resonance there. 
they resonate with those messages of being told what to do and get in line and follow the orders and follow the instructions and follow the mandates and follow these things. And there are those of us that, that are lis listening to something else. And I have loved that about my journey, but again, you're not the most popular one at the party like you were describing. You aren't, it's not, those people who are listening to the instructions aren't curious about what we're curious about. They don't find this has any value. And in fact, they kind of look at you like, where did you come from? <laughs> and, and, you know, we might look at ourselves like, yeah, I didn't come from here either. And I know it too. That's why I think also, there's this fortification and there's this strengthening. It's part of why you and I podcast because we have this deep connection. We will go into these inquiries, even if we don't know the answers, we'll journey into that. And there's such richness. Our souls are like nourished by these conversations where other people are like, where's the door? How can I turn the volume or shut this off? Where that's not what they're summoned to and attracted to. And I, I think I've prepared for lifetimes and know a lot about, talk about that, those karmic pieces when we've been maturing at soul level. I know there are lifetimes when I wasn't listening. I've, I think I've actually always been a listener or my, my most salient memories are one who knows a little bit beyond what most people know. I have a lot of lifetimes like that, but then living in a world where people are not very awake and, you know, that would be a quick way to get you killed in, in some lifetimes, right? They don't like it. They don't like truth speakers or people who are curious and discoverers. But I've learned even in those lifetimes, even when I was that, Paul, I was still evolving and learning my lessons. And I know I have deep memories of when I wasn't listening as deep, as deep as I needed to, to transcend some of those moments differently. It's like you talk about the cathars that come up in some of our podcasts because you lived through that experience i might i might very well have been there with you um but i know for you that's a really deep experience and that impressed itself in your memory banks and you when you read about them it's like you're there you have memory you know what that was like and i have memory kind of the times of lemuria where I was surrounded by these masters at the time and I was a master next to them, but not in age and, and, ex, and experience. Yes, but not in spiritual growth. I, I wasn't listening because as Lemuria was sinking under the water, I have memory of looking into their faces and they're at total one mint, even though there's like things that are like on fire that are floating in the water with this like it's total chaos and our, our civilization is ended it's come to its end but they're in complete peace and in the oneness and they're sovereign and they're in union and i was not i was not okay with that and i could i i think i have this deep memory of looking into their faces that they knew something that they had listened differently than i had the capacity to listen then and they left that lifetime and probably transcended out of this whole stratosphere and didn't have to repeat another 26,000 year cycle and no no me no I'm still here right because I didn't listen and maybe that's also why channeling was probably a, a scribing you know I've been a scribe for life lifetimes and I know how to listen to subtle frequencies and because I think I made a pledge to myself you will always listen whether it's popular, unpopular, well-received, not received, rejected, judged, whatever. And I'm still in that journey, but you know, more and more, I feel like I fly free of needing to belong at a party, like kind of what you described. I think there are a lot of empaths and people who have this awareness, like we're talking about today, that have had an experience like that, like, wow, I'm not a good chit chatter. I, I would always say I'm not good at a cocktail party, you know, because these people have this, these jokes and this person's talking and gossiping about someone else. And I just don't have anything to contribute to that. It's not where we shine. It's, it's not us. No, we're people who like, you know, explore all kinds of things or share about our dreams or, you know, I watched a dragonfly or I have deer in my backyard and they teach me something every day. They're so tuned in. They, and I don't know if you've ever watched deer, I don't know how many, you know, do you have deer where you are? They're amazing. And just, they can be totally 
I'm very connected with the deer that visit my yard and, um, and they pass through on their migration patterns. But they can be totally communing with me and having a connection. But boy, a neighbor comes and their ear, it, you know, they're still right here, but they're, they're so tuned in to just about everything else, things that I'm not even detecting, but they are aware. And I, I am mentored by nature. Like I see how, you know, they, they are listening to something far bigger than even I'm tapped into sometimes. And I marvel at that. And it makes me a better listener. And I pay attention to those things, but that's not a popular skill or characteristic at a cocktail party. They're just thinking you're weird, right? Or just don't know how to relate. And you're the one that just doesn't have something to contribute to the conversation. So you feel out of place. Those of us that feel out of place in that 3D world of those kinds of communications are the ones that are really ju jumping timelines that are in this higher spiritual growth timeline where we know this is some of the greatest marrow that we've had in lifetimes. And this is like the launching pad where I think we are quantum leaping. And then we may very well be those pupils who become teachers and people just want to be in the presence of people who knew how to have faith and listen when everything was falling around them, like those beings that were treading water for a period of time, like me at the end of Lemuria, just before we all fell under the sea. They fell under in peace and I fell under in complete angst and conflicted and cognitive dissonance that I, I knew in that moment that I had not evolved at the level that they had. And that seared itself into my memory, not as a judgment, but as something that I took with me to pay attention and to listen differently to the worlds in between the worlds in the other lifetimes I knew I was going to have. And that's how I think we transcend these times where there's so much pain and suffering and confusion and people making choices and judging and persecution and the, just the craziness of what's going on, on this planet. But I feel more a closely akin to those elders, you know, that were my peers at the time, but more spiritually advanced than me. And I feel like I'm the one in that place of calm a lot of the time, not to say that I can't get triggered because I can. But I know with those triggers, oh, I have that memory from that lifetime. Oh, don't chomp on that trigger and go into the fear. You feel the trigger and you go into faith and you learn how to see this differently and you, you grow even deeper. And that's how those of us are listening. And I think we are going to be the ones that emerge and at least illustrate by our beingness, our be still, I think you said, right? In that phrase, we're gonna be still in what it's taken us lifetimes to cultivate, to know how to be this in a time, to be still in a time that's chaotic, to be still in a time of quantumly accelerating change and growth on a level, which is where I started, that people can't even comprehend. But when we can find that stillness inside ourselves, even just one step towards that, right? Into embodying that ourselves. You know, I can't grab that from you, Paul, and you can't grab that from me because we cultivate it from inside ourselves, but it sure helps to be in the presence of people that you can see in their eyes. They know what we're talking about. We know what we're talking about. I know what those Lemurian friends and colleagues and peers and brothers and sisters of mine, I still see them looking at me because I can see it in their faces. They knew what I didn't know. And we're here to be doing this together, Paul, in our own ways. We are knowing what we are knowing. We're triggered too. But we have that inner guidance system that knows, go out of nature, go mow the lawn, and, you know, go listen to music that inspires our soul. Go into that in-between world's place where things are real and where faith this at this level lives and where soul sight can come in to guide us and we can listen to the, to the language and the messages of our soul which is not turning on the mainstream media, right? We know that the truth that is true truth, timeless, timeless. That's what I hear also in your, the child that was grabbing the like cocoa puffs or whatever it was. Um, you asked it, uh, it was, it was quake. Quake? It was, it was kind of like King Vitamin, but it was before King Vitamin. It was it's great stuff, but they don't make it anymore. Yeah, I don't remember that. Like I'm thinking like Lucky Charms or yeah. 
but but you know you you access that part a timeless part of yourself that spoke to you that lives outside of time right it's like we pat you passed yourself multidimensionally in that moment and had the ability to listen to that and when you heard that message that you'll remember this right in the future it was another call i think at soul level to pay attention you knew to pay attention to moments like that when they happened people like us do Lots of other people just blow right past that, grab another handful of cereal, like, oh, that was weird. And they're, you know, they're back watching their show and they're checked out, right? I would like to invite people to make more time. We don't have to meditate for an hour because that's not how I connect with my spirit either. But I have moments where I think I've just, I've allowed this willingness inside myself to relax and be in the stillness when I go outside in my backyard or I'm doing the dishes or there's these quiet moments where I breathe the conscious breathing, I breathe it deeper and I go to in between worlds, places. And that's where I get access a lot of the information that guides me through and gives me strength and gives me faith and not faith in people of this world or something outside myself. It's actually me accessing divinity, yeah. You can contract, be still, just to even a shorter statement, and just say be, 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 and it's a it's an extremely zenful outlook, and 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 your all your work and all of your teaching on breathing is that state, is a zenful state, mm -hmm. it's just being, and <clears throat> being in the present moment, just like you said, which then transcends time you're 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 between the the infinite future and the infinite past and you're in that infinite state yeah so 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 that that, that that's um that that's something that i actually experienced <clears throat> i think all of us have it it's an inner temple and um they say that we create that through deeds of love we create an inner temple within us and if you can be within the inner temple, then you're in that state, you know, and this, and, and that's what, uh, it's like the Shinto Buddhist uh, temple builders, they build these beautiful temples. Well, you know, I saw it in a, in a vision and there it was, it was, it was a sanctuary. And that was my, that's my state. That's my being state. And even though I don't physically see it, I can feel the presence of being in it. And yes. so that's, and the other thing too, is that they say that when, and then I don't, you know, I have no idea what's coming. You know, I, part of me still thinks I'm being tricked. Part of me still thinks because of all the ages of deception, I still can't quite get over that, but you have to have faith. And so I have faith and that's why I'm out on the streets, you know, blowing up buildings and stuff like that, because even that wasn't going to work. I understand that you can't, there's nowhere to run. You can't escape this planet because apparently the whole thing is focused on what's happening right here. This is going to have effects on other worlds. Uh -huh. So we're here, for, we're here for the duration. We're here for whatever the outcome is going to be, you know. So there, there isn't anywhere else, anywhere else to go. We're kind of committed to whatever, whatever the outcome is is going to be here. Um, but yeah, so the, this inner temple that that does exist, it is there, and we build it through through deeds of love. And and so they say that um, if we can and live in that that being state the state of being that very zenful state you know, like you're talking about the breathing and all the other things <clears throat> then we might maybe maybe this may maybe this maybe this is a way to explain it and maybe i'm wrong i don't know but they say that you can control your physical age or physical appearance i'm wondering <clears throat> that might be possible but could it also be that you might start manifesting as your true spiritual age you know um i don't think there's going to be anyone <clears throat> on the planet unfortunately that doesn't get through a certain path past their adolescence so would it be a, an accurate statement to say that you know you know i felt like for the longest time i was 17 years old and then i started saying well maybe i'm 18. quite frankly after all of this lockdown and and even before that and the journey that i've taken I think I've probably aged considerably regarding my spiritual age, but I don't think I'm older than 30. 
um, I'm still probably sometime in somewhere in my my, my early to mid twenties, maybe. But maybe that's where we wind up seeing ourselves manifesting as where we resonate most strongly at our true spiritual age in, in the in the future. They say that that's how the physical the, our physical manifestation. They say you can choose whatever age you want, and maybe that's possible. But I also feel like, well, yeah, maybe maybe the easiest thing would be to just be living within that energy that, you know, that we've accumulated and that, you know, that's, that's how we would, that's how we would manifest ourselves. You know? Right. That mastery that we just didn't enjoy that place. Right. I know. Right. So, and maybe I'm wrong, but um, to me that, that, that seems like something that would be easily accomplished in, uh, in a world that's moved past this, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that the world that is ascending. Right. So, mm -hmm. You know, um, I know we had seated one, the only thing we didn't get back to today, but it might need to be another day unless there's something real quick. Cause I think we're probably close to an hour and a half, but was the harbingers. Do you think that's another conversation, a different conversation? Well, okay. so you know, you brought it up in the last, in the last um, transmission, at least the, I think the one from the 19th of October, I think that's yeah. the one I saw. <clears throat> and um, I wasn't surprised when you started talking about the Eagle. So um, that's really was exciting, but uh, like I said, it, that was a it's it's a harbinger of you call it a harbinger or they call it the harbinger of peace. Mm. But there's more to that if you want to think about it. So now we have a lion, and now we have an eagle, right? Is there any mythological being that is a lion and an eagle? The answer is there is. It's called a griffin. Oh, griffin. <laughs> Griffin is a, has wings and uh, and a head of an eagle and the body of a lion, right? <clears throat> so now, what does a griffin do? And the griffin basically is this amazing mythological being that um, it's like the harbinger of divine justice, mm. harbinger of harbinger of peace. In some instances, they belonged to Zeus. But in other instances, and I love this one, <clears throat> they belonged to Nemesis. Nemesis was the goddess of divine justice, of, of, of retribution. And they oh, those, yeah. those were the animals, or the, those were that was the energy that she um, wielded, was the was the, um, was the griffin, which was again <clears throat> the lion eagle energies. Um, they also they also guarded tremendous amounts of value or wealth or gold, and so they cer they certainly acted as um, what we would say threshold guardians. Mm. But <clears throat> so they they prevented certain people from crossing a certain threshold. And you know what? That's cool. I don't want to get into that because that that gets real convoluted. But. Um, the nemesis was thought to be an aspect of Venus. Mm. So, 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 so it's just a divine goddess, right? But the, the Venus is connected to that. So <clears throat> what's the third harbinger? And so that, that's coming. And, and that's such an amazing story. We really should probably spend a lot of time devoting to this. But um, we talked about the first harbinger was the, the lion. And that lion is etheric energy, and that's that spiritual power that that ex exists within us. The second harbinger is the eagle, and that's extremely important. Maybe I'm the way I'm looking at this this spiritual alignment. It may be the most important one, only eagle. because there's some. Yeah, well, it's in a place where we might be astrologically compelled to. Um, ascend you know it's in it's in the sign of the scorpion or as you mentioned the you did mention scorpion also serpent poisonous animals animals Poison. of conflict right so we're really moving beyond that and we're and we're, we're now we're, we're now embracing the the transfiguration in these times that we're talking about right now into this noble being, this 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 um, this eagle. The eagle is just this amazing animal, and you and you summed it up very well. You 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 articulated it very well in, in your discussion. So both animals are animals of courage, of power, of their no, noble nobility, 
of clear of clarity of thinking and 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 and, and, and courageous and pure heart. So that's all there, right? And that would be in, involved or embedded within a griffin. Because a griffin is again an art an, an, a, 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 a harbinger of divine justice. Mm. Both. Well, that are, feels like we're on the crest of more justice. Well, yeah. Well, well, we have to. We have to. We have to let those energies work within us. You know, because we are the instrument of divine justice. We are personally the instrument of divine justice. That's we're going through the transfiguration. And the, so the third harbinger, and I'll probably get this wrong, right? <laughs> I don't know what the third one is. I know you don't. You know, <laughs> but if we, were, if we were to look at it from, from, from the mythological perspective, or as I, I'm seeing this as the, they call it the tetramorph, the four angels of the human being, and it's connected to astrology and it's connected to holistic healing. The fourth, the fourth or the third harbinger would be related to a, a human being of some sort, right? Because if you put a human head or a human face on the griffin, now you have a sphinx, right? And so, so, so that I think is what it is. And as a being of, um, of, um, of Venus or of Nemesis, um, the, 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 uh, the way that the Greeks portrayed the, um, the Sphinx was a griffin with uh, the, the head of a woman and the, and the bust of a woman. Mm. So, 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 so you're looking and that's very interesting because that composite being um, is a summation in a, in a, in a let's say, a, in, or an illustration of, of the summation of what they call the subtle bodies of the human being. And so, and now if you look at the Sphinx, the one that exists in, in Egypt or the ones that exist in Egypt, it's a masculine head because it has a, has like a beard. That can oh. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's just the human being. And so that ties in that we talked about it in the last time we talked about Oedipus and yes, it ties in that human mystery, you know, it's, it's all embedded within that, but um, there's going to be a lot of things that are going to come out um, in the winter. And so we're looking at some really interesting mythologies specifically tied to Prometheus and Pandora. And also the way that God treated us, which was Zeus, who basically treated us just as bad as as um, as as Jehovah did in the and and in, in oh, the uh, Job story. Job. Yes, so it all kind of will come out. Like I think it, at least it'll be fun to talk about from that mythological perspective, because there's been a lot of injuries, a lot of transgressions, uh, as we perceive them at least, a lot of a karma that we have to let go of, a lot of wrongs that have to be righted, not by the gods, but by us. And, you know, and that story of Pandora is extremely important, especially for this time of the year, because that was a trick that was played upon humanity by Zeus. He gave, they gave her this box and she became, I think the wife of Prometheus. And she, they said, live your life, God bless you, but don't open the box. She did. She opened the box. And what she released was all these astral energies which have pervaded humanity s since that point. So since the fall. And uh, that's really what we have to rectify at this point. And the one thing that, that stayed in the box, it's still in the box. So if you can open the box now, because there's one thing left in the box and that was hope. Mm. Or, right. So it's still there. So now we have to resurrect that. We have to we have to move forward. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You said that so beautifully, Paul. I mean, I just I love I love it's like music that comes through you the way you understand these characters and these beings and these um, heroes and the in the stories that we have. I was also feeling what I think we've also talked about and you've kind of intimated today is that we have to evolve our understanding of creator. We have to evolve our understanding of the divine and the source energy in us and our relationship with that energy and our connection with that, which of course, in a lot of the transmissions comes about union with source. That is union from within inside us, 
with this source, you know, the, the source. Um, I think we are evolving our understanding of what, what that means. And I think we don't yet know what that means because we're in process, we're in transit, we're, we're, we're cultivating this now. And there's enough circumstances on our planet that even the person sleeping the deepest or somebody who's really turned away from knowing this from within is there's events that are going to call people like I would say in my own journey where I've been on my knees, you know, where it takes me to my knees, the suffering is so great. And sometimes that's when we become the most willing to grow to the next level and in letting go the one we were clinging so tightly to that there's that precipice metaphor holding on so tight you can't go to the next level and be holding on so tight it's when you let go that the next level appears and i think we're in this part of this process too right so um that's so interesting about the griffin energy that can be walking with us and yeah we've we still have like i said i think we still have quite a bit of october like there's a lot of energy still in october um and we're nearly like two days left but you know the cosmos and creation doesn't care about that <laughs> it, oh, yeah. it, right timing is right timing and um and it's going to reveal to us what needs to be revealed and then i think there's a whole lot of november and there's there is a lot of december waters are calmer in december i think if there's more integration there's more other things going on in december somehow and um, november feels like another very active phase of our spiritual evolution like our growth and our expansion if we could understand if humanity could understand that this is a journey that we're not just here doing time like a prison planet where a lot of people sort of those are the lenses through which they look because that was their school experience and we were taught that you know you get in line you wear your uniform you follow the rules if we could understand this is an adventure and we're here to extract the lessons and that the soul inside us wants to grow through our experiences we'd have a whole different experience of even this pandemic we would have a whole different we'd feel more free to explore because we're not trying to follow rules we're were souls expanding in divine consciousness different totally different experience of what's been happening on the planet and some of us feel it this way and some of us are in the trap and mad at everybody else that's not following the rules so well to be continued right as always right. so i want to thank you for joining me it is always such a gift paul such a gift and i hope that really all of the people that listen to our messages and the musings that we go in and the conversations we have with ourselves and our higher selves and the guides like this is meant for all of us this is a time of inquiry this is a time of discovery and yes there are times of suffering and there's triggers going on around us and inside all of us but if we can you know get either playful with it or curious about it or willing to, or even the surrendering part of it, you know, that's what suffering will summon inside of us is this essence of this is bigger than me. This is just bigger than me. And I'm bigger than the me I understand me to be. And here we are. So we, we're going to keep growing. We're going to keep having these podcasts. Um, I invite people to visit me at frequencywriter.com whole soul mastery eventually just like the griffin the lion and the hawk are going to merge those two websites are working themselves out i just have to get with my web designer to sort of combine them into one 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 voice one 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 place on the web but when you look at social media you can always find me at whole soul mastery if uh if you're looking for more inspiring podcasts and to hang out with people in these higher timelines that are curious about the things and growing in the ways that you're growing and being stretched and summoned. So thank you, everybody. And we'll see you next time. Blessings.